here at 11.53 a.m. We've come out of closed session, and we will be breaking shortly for lunch and for petitioner hearings, but in the meantime, we're going to move forward to item number 11, uh, Government Affairs Committee meeting update. So, I'm Dr. Julie Elginer. I'm a public member, and I chair the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, I want to just call your attention to a couple of different things. Um, one is under tab 14. It has our legislative action for the year. And so uh, summarized are the pieces of legislation that we took positions on, as well as um, those that we were watching or had no position on. And then on the summary of bills, it has what the final outcomes were. So uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pieces of legislation that we were following this year on behalf of the board. And I want to just pause and thank Marcus MacArthur, who's our staff liaison. He's done an excellent job this year um, uh, serving our committee. And unless there are any questions, there's no action that we need in terms of pieces of pending legislation. Unless Dr. Azzolino has any that you're aware of, the, the legislative calendar has passed, so uh, the, you know there's nothing moving forward. I do want to say that that again, call to your attention, there are pieces of legislation that died this year, but that we will likely see again next year. And so um, right now, the committee composition is myself, Mr. Mr. Rufino, and Dr. Rosa. Um, the committee is very well poised to be able to follow those pieces of legislation that will come back next year and be able to um, offer the, their consideration on them. So I just want to make sure that um, for those pieces of legislation that did not move forward this year for a variety of reasons, um, there's a good chance that they come forward next year and call people's attention. The other thing I want to point out before we move to the strategic planning component, which will be a separate um, a separate agenda item is that we have our annual uh, meet and greets with the, the legislative staffers and um, those uh, personnel in agency positions and senior agency positions. It's the time where we share with them the work that the board has done, the goals that we've accomplished, what our uh, objectives are for the next year. Those meetings are taking place in November. Correct me if I'm wrong, November 17th, 18th, is that correct? John or, or, or Frank? Okay, so in the next uh, few weeks, we'll be scheduling those meetings. Generally, they're held in the afternoon of one day and the morning of the next, and we pack it in. We tend to um, meet with at least five to eight um, staffers, individuals um, that have the ability to make recommendations and guidance over the board. Um, in both the governor's administration as well as um, the legislature. So I want to point out that this is, I believe, our fourth year we've done it, and it's been very successful. It allows us to be able to have dialogue, to give visibility to the board, help them understand the, the strengths and what, how we've moved the board forward over the last four years. Um, and those meetings will be, like I said, they'll be taking place in November. I have nothing further. The big uh, deliverable for our committee this year is the strategic plan. We're going to be discussing that in, um, you know, in, after lunch and after the petitioner hearings. So unless my committee members have anything else that they'd like to offer, I think that summarizes our committee's positions this year. Or Marcus, anything I missed? Dr. Rosa? No. Okay. Frank? Thank you. All right, good. Thank you, Joey. <laughs> Let's wait one moment. Robert, we're back on the record here. Okay, I can start with John. So we've gone through the Government Affairs Committee already. Do you want to um, do the licensing continuing education update? Okay. With Dr. Dane? Uh, yes, I, I spoke with Dr. Dane and um, we, um, the licensing CE committee, we continue to um, hold meetings and discuss uh, potential changes to the CE regs, in particular the provider qualifications. Uh, we've been working on that um, uh, for well over a year now, and there's uh, 
sorry, what's my train of thought? Um, there, um, as everybody knows, we've had a couple of focus groups where we've invited participation um, from the CE providers and any other interested parties uh, so that we can take all that into consideration when we're looking at possible changes to the law. And uh, so there's nothing has taken place. They, the, the committee hasn't uh, finalized this or made any decisions uh, to present to the board. Um, so that's really all we have to update. And um, I will ask um, Dr. McLean and Dr. Lickman, if they're both members of the committee, if they have anything they'd like to add or um, comment on regarding licensing and CE. I have a couple of things. Just. Um, in addition to that, we have been working tirelessly and working on um, the possibility of creating publication to inform the public of the education and training for DCs, and that's um, concentrating on um, scope, school, prereqs, education. Um, this was propelled by Dr. Dane's uh, visit or her work with Palmer, um, which was very informative for her, and it's important that in the aspect that we educate the public as well as policymakers on our qualifications and our scope. And that's why we were prepared to do that. Additionally, we'd like, we are still looking for suggestions um, of how to increase our uh, social media presence and our likes and uh, et cetera. So, and we're also looking for content still, um, or staff has done a very good job with content um, on the website, but we're also, really want to encourage and urge urge other DCs to um, provide content for the page, uh, uh, for our website and our social media outlets as as well. Um, and is that it? Um, and we just, again, like Robert said, we're continuing to work on the CE provider and CCR with standards. Um, because it is, you know, pretty arduous, and it has been a very long process. And um, the members have worked tirelessly before my joining the committee, but it's it's quite a daunting task. And so that the public understands that it's not something that can be done overnight. We're really working hard on getting that done. Thank you. Yes. Can I also just offer one thing? Uh, this is for everyone that's attending and viewing. I can't stress enough the importance of the work being done at the committee level and the committee meetings are publicly noticed just like all of the meetings if you want to be involved in your profession a very valuable and a very easy way to access the board is through participation on the committee level come to the meetings attend offer your suggestions offer your thoughts that's where the work is being done so there's no reason why there's zero participation by the profession or by the public, but especially by the profession as it relates to the committee meetings. There's, there's, it's inexcusable in my opinion. So I really want to emphasize that all of the committee meetings are an opportunity for everyone as part of the profession to engage in this work and provide meaningful impact as part of the process. Most of our committee meetings take place via teleconference, so there are locations in northern and exactly. southern California that you can very easily uh, present to. Completely agree. And at every meeting, you're welcome. As you see, there's always an opportunity and a place for public discussion on any matter. Anything further? That's it for me. So do you want to go for uh, hearing, hearing. That's fine with me if it's fine with you guys okay moving forward to the hearing since we have a court report? Yeah. We don't have a judge. ALJ, do we have an ALJ here? Oh, oh, oh okay. can, perfect. Can we break or just have Why don't we, uh, we're going to just take a 10 minute break, a quick 10 minute break so we can get organized here for our hearing. That's not until after. Don't we have to? I mean, I don't think we have to. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to stop at a certain time. I mean, you know, we. Um, I, I don't think it's critical that we do. Can we maybe take a, a half an hour break just to allow people? Get, can we start at twelve thirty instead? Yeah, we'll start after lunch. Ten minutes and then let's go. Because then we can take. We're going to take a half an hour break while the court reporter practices. <laughs> we give the ALJ a moment to. Uh, 
get situated up here, and that will be our lunch period. And then we're going to be moving straight forward for the rest of the afternoon. Okay. Okay, so we're back on the record here in the petition hearings of uh, Daniel Brady and Robert Glover, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Judge Adam Berg. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's go on the record. And we are on the record on the matter of the petition for filming modification for Daniel Brady. It's number 2016-09-0176, agency number AC-10-760. Today's date is October 14th, 2016, here in being held in San Diego, California, before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Adam Berg is the Administrative Law Judge from the State's Office of Administrative Hearings. Hearing the case today with the Board, will the Deputy Attorney General please identify yourself, sir? Yes, Ted Durkar, that's spelled D-R-C-A-R, uh, Deputy Attorney General. Okay, thank you. And to the petitioner, Mr. Brady, good afternoon. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Okay. And you're representing yourself today? I am. And yes. you have been through one of these proceedings before, I take it? Yes, yeah. I am. Uh, it's going to work the same way. Uh, Mr. Derkar is going to present a brief factual background on the case, um, after which will be your turn. You um, already passed up another couple documents here. Um, you have the right to call any witnesses and testify in your own behalf. At the end of the hearing, uh, the board will make, meet in closed session and deliberate and decide your case, and you will receive a written decision in the mail, hopefully within a few weeks. A few weeks, okay. All right, great. Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, again, I'm Deputy Attorney General Ted Durkar, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General, uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, and representing the people of the state of California. My role here is to protect the public interest. The nature of our proceeding, as you know, is a petition for early termination of probation uh, by Dr. Daniel Brady. And um, I believe we have uh, before all of you um, what uh, I call uh, asked pre-mark as Exhibit 1, which is the petition package, um, which has been circulated. And uh, by way of uh, background, uh, I'll point out some of the uh, basic facts about this. This is the first hearing on a petition for early termination of Dr. Brady's uh, probation. Uh, let me tell you about the origin of the probationary discipline. Um, Dr. Brady was first licensed as a chiropractor in 2000. In November 2009, an accusation was filed to revoke Dr. Brady's license for practicing the Whitcomb method of uh, treating fibromyalgia patients. Dr. Brady uh, agreed to a stipulated surrender of his license effective October 21st, 2010. This uh, was based on admitted violations of one, unprofessional conduct slash gross negligence, two, unprofessional conduct slash incompetence, and three, uh, the rules regarding advertising. On May 24th, 2012, so that's about two years later, Dr. Brady's license was reinstated, subject to five years of probation and cost recovery of $6,000. Due to tolling during out-of-state practice, Dr. Brady's five-year probation period is scheduled to continue to May 2019, if nothing were done here today. Uh, Dr. Brady has exhausted about half of the five-year probation period, and at last accounting, the facts and figures that were uh, presented to me in the packet, Dr. Brady has a cost recovery balance of $1,716. Um, the petitioner, in this case Dr. Brady, has the burden of proof. It is his burden to demonstrate that he is rehabilitated and that his probation should be ended early. The board has discretion whether to grant an early end of probation. Because the burden is him, therefore, I have nothing further at this time, but I reserve the right to cross-examine Dr. Brady or call him if he chooses uh, not to testify. And I would ask that he testify from uh, the chair that he's sitting in now. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any questions for me at this juncture. 
Okay, uh, Exhibit 1 will be received as evidence as a petition packet. Uh, Dr. Brady handed up a letter from uh, Dr. Muir uh, that will be marked as Exhibit uh, 2 and received. Uh, Dr. Brady, do you have any witnesses today? I do not. Okay, uh, if you would stand and raise your right hand, I will swear you in. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you'll be giving will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. All right, this is your opportunity to tell the board what you think it needs to know about your case. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, board. Um, I would like to ask the board to consider an early termination of my probation time. This will allow me to practice as an unrestricted practitioner and will remove any potential and current barriers attaining any new employment. By removing, by removing my remaining probationary time, this will allow me to apply and have an increased chance for removal of the Medica Medical Exclusion List. Uh, since being on probation and placed on this exclusion list, this, is, has, been, this has prevented me from pursuing, pursuing my passion not only as a chiropractor but also as a physician assistant. In addition, as we all know, practicing in today's world has presented itself with many hurdles to overcome. After surrendering my license, I have not been denied. After surrendering my license, I have not only been denied employment at a federal health care clinic as a physician assistant, but because of being on the Medi-Cal exclusion list and my probationary status, it's also been challenging to get contracted with many insurance carriers. I feel that I am now a different and improved provider in the healthcare world since 2010. Um, and having to surrender my license. Yes, I have to admit things have been challenging not only in my professional career, but also my personal life as well. I have taken all those challenging times and turned them into some opportunities. I felt compelled to go back to school as a result, and I am now enjoying being a licensed physician assistant in the state of Nevada and would like to add to the chiropractic profession in my current office. In my current place of employment, my employer does like the idea of adding my skills as a chiropractor, but does not want to move forward due to the circumstances involving my probationary status. If I was not on probation with my chiropractic license in the state of California, he would be more willing to allow me to do what I do best, which will enhance the practice as being able to provide the patients with more comprehensive choices for their health care. I would also like to say thank you for accepting my application for relicensure back in 2012. I appreciate that. Um, it, has been, it has been helpful with my professional career. So basically to recap, um, these are the reasons why I feel I should have the remaining probationary time removed. Uh, one, I've been carrying myself in an ethical and professional manner in all areas of my life, and I feel I've been completely rehabilitated regarding the penalty. I have never had any other prior disciplinary actions taken against me by the California Board, any state, local, or federal agencies. I've been in compliance with the terms of my probation and orders against, uh, against me. I have been paying a monthly payment to the board. I've been paying my, um, I plan on paying my final balance, which is $1,716 by the end of this month, October. Uh, I also finished and passed the retaking of the ethics exam for both California and Nevada. I continue to be up to, up to date with all my continuing education um, CEs. I keep uh, kept up to date with both California Chiropractic Board and Nevada Chiropractic Board and my phys Nevada Physician Assistant license. Uh, previous chiropractic or previous CEs, I usually go to for chiropractic. I go to the Triad seminars in Lake Tahoe. I've been doing it for the last uh, three years, and we'll be doing it again this coming December. Uh, I completed my uh, physician assistant CMEs for 2015. I went to an ICA seminar uh, back in 2011 covering topics of jurisprudence, x-rays, and techniques. I continue to be uh, updated on my BLS, American Red Cross. Um, I also have Competed, uh, completed homeopathic seminars uh, for my advanced practitioner of homeopathy license back in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 20 hours of education uh, for each and every one of those. I do some online anatomy courses for some of my CEs. 
So I went back to school and attended the University of North Dakota and received a master's in physician assistant studies uh, with above average grades. I graduated in May of 2014. I was awarded that license by the Nevada Medical Board on uh, December 2014 and have been in active practice as both a physician assistant and a chiropractor since graduating. I continue to be an active member in my community by volunteering some of my time to some uh, nonprofit groups. I do do a one-year holiday season, go to a local food bank and um, volunteer some of my time with that, uh, with my family. I've established safeguards to prevent any, to prevent repetition of the original violation. I have placed it upon myself to ask the board and some of my local co colleagues to review any advertising methods I've been thinking about before it's ever placed in front of the public eye. I use all appropriate professional medical chiropractic accepted methods for treatment. I continue to refer to the JMPT for any current and updated uh, information. I feel that I have been fully rehabilitated from any leak, from any and all legal sanctions that placed upon me from the board, and I'm confident that I can provide above standard level of care to all my patients. I feel that my skills and knowledge base are adequate to provide chiropractic health care to my community. I plan on continuing my rehabilitation efforts because as a doctor of chiropractic, I am personally held at a higher level of standard. I will always feel that I can always strive to be a better individual in my private and professional life for the remaining years of my life. So with the remaining penalties removed, I feel that I can um, be just a better provider in my community. I continue, as for now, I still live in Reno, Nevada as a chiropractor and physician assistant with my wife and children. If granted removal of my probationary time, um, I would then uh, place my license in California in an inactive status since I do live in, in practice mainly in Reno uh, with possible great hopes to practice again in California as a full-time practice uh, practitioner. Okay, thank you. That's it, yes, Mr. Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Dr. Brady, since you yes. were reinstated on probation. Have you been arrested or convicted uh, for any offense other than a traffic violation? No. There was something uh, that you mentioned here in your presentation, um, and I focused on it in the letter you've written to the board. This is uh, from his letter, and I'm looking at the page being stamped up, BCE, page 12, if anybody wants to follow along. He wrote, and I quote, I have established safeguards to prevent repetition of the original violation. I have placed it upon myself to ask the board and some of my local colleges to review any advertising methods I'm thinking about before it is placed in front of the public eye." Unquote. I'm unclear on what you meant by that. Is that a concept about how you would do your advertising or is that actually something you've been doing? No, it would be a concept if I came out with a so-called advertising um, method uh, before I ever took it upon myself to go out and place the ad, I would most likely ask the board or ask some of my colleagues, hey, do you think this is appropriate for what I'm doing? Do you feel like it's uh, reasonable advertising and not overstepping any kind of boundaries, not putting any pay, you know, people at harm or at risk of anything? Um, just, you know, just so it's not sensationalizing anything what I do, just being able to get what I do out there. Um, but I would, since what happened in the past, I would definitely take that opportunity to run it by one of my colleagues or the board. All right, so it, supposing that you wanted to add, run an ad in a yeah. magazine, okay. um, what do you think you would do with your uh, proposed ad? Who would you present it to? Okay. It depends um, if more or less, I mean, it kind of depends on what kind of population I was trying to grab on that advertising method, like say it was personal injury or general health care, um, I would just make sure that it uh, falls within the guidelines of any kind of advertising, um, not overstepping my boundaries, not making something that I am not up, uh, you know, just more or less those kind of lines. I'm not really trying to, I'm trying to. What are you trying to ask me more specifically? Well, I want to, I'm kind of exploring whether this is a, a concept that you really have a, a way in mind that you would implement it, or, right. yeah, well, I mean, you're really going to have some peer review. 
Oh yeah, no, I would, I would, but my current status as an employee employee of a medical practice, um, I don't do any advertising. If if I ever ended up stepping outside and uh, working for myself um, in order to attain business, I would absolutely probably need to uh, do some marketing and get the word out of what I do and where I'm at um, and what I can help with um, as for certain conditions, chiropractic conditions that can help, for, help with. These days, uh, what range of services might you provide to someone seeking treatment from you for fibromyalgia? Within the chiropractic field? I mean, it's, it's well, you're a licensed chiropractor. I know I you're licensed in other disciplines. I am. What, what range of services might you provide to someone who comes to you with fibromyalgia? Well, it would be typical musculoskeletal treatments. Um, a lot of the techniques that I was taught in, uh, in the school that I went to at Palmer West, uh, standardized protocols, um, helping people with their musculoskeletal problems. And that would be within the chiropractic realm. If I wanted to open up and use my physician assistant license, that'd be a whole other different type of treatment too. That'd be medicines, um, which we won't talk about here, but. All right. Um, the a probation compliance report says that um, you travel to California monthly to mm -hmm. practice to comply with the probation order. Is that correct? Correct. Could you describe those monthly visits for us? Sure. So currently right now, and I'll, I'll kind of just work backwards. I go to a colleague's uh, office of mine who's in the El Dorado Hills area, uh, Lowry Chiropractic. Uh, he's a colleague, and he opens up his office to me uh, on the weekends. I'll sometimes meet him there and adjust him. Every once in a while, I have my wife with me and I adjust her. Uh, he will adjust my adjust me. Since I don't have a uh, so-called patient base in California since most of my time is spent in Nevada, uh, according to the guidelines and my probationary monitor, there was uh, the limitations I had as long as I saw somebody in the state of California once a month that would satisfy the requirements that I was needing to do. So I've been, yes, traveling from Reno to, to uh, California every month. How long have you been going to this uh, friend's practice in El Dorado Hills? The one in El Dorado Hills, not that long because the uh, previous guy that I was going to in South Lake Tahoe, he ended up selling his practice. So when, um, basically when, kind of when that happened, I ended up uh, needing to find a, a different place and that's when I called up. Was your practice at the South Lake with the yeah. South Lake Tahoe yes. uh, practitioner? Yeah. Uh, was it similar to what you described at El Dorado Hills, where you adjusted your wife and Absolutely. the doctor himself? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the doctor himself. He no, no, normally wasn't there. It would be normally the wife. I would adjust. There's a uh, naturopathic doctor that I know. I would adjust him every once in a while. But it would basically be just him, my wife. Um, and my kids every once in a while. My kids would go up there too. And I just um, in the state of California, again, to satisfy those requirements. How long were you associated for that monthly weekend practice in South Lake Tahoe? Does that take us back to when take, you first? Yeah, take us, takes us all the way back. To, to what was the beginning? It, May 2012. Cor correct. Correct. All right, so since May 2012, uh, I take it, except for those periods uh, when your probation was told, mm -hmm. you were working in California one day a month? Correct. And so then, would, would I be correct that about 5% of your working days were spent in California? 5%? Yeah, yeah. One throw it on a percentage basis. Yeah, I suppose I mean, it, was, it, was, it was more or less just one day a month and I would <laughs> go up there. Yeah, one day a month. That one day a month. Okay. And uh, let's see, why was your probation told from February 2013 to February 2015? It was due to financial reasons. You, could you explain why did the financial reasons keep you from practicing in California? It was due since... 
from what I believe that if you cannot pay your monthly payment for X amount of time period for an X period of time, that you can put yourself on a tolling status and delay those payments until you're ready to start making payments again. And so when I was I was going through school, um, things were really tight. You know, PA school is very expensive, uh, and so every dollar kind of. You know, I, so I took that opportunity upon myself to use that time for that. During those two years of tolling, were, were you working other than as a chiropractor in California? Yeah, in Nevada. What, what were you doing? I was working as an advanced homeopathic practitioner and as a chiropractor and, and both professions. Was it full time? What kind of days and hours? No, it was it was, was part time. Um, I can't remember the exact days and hours. The clinic was only open four days a week, and I would go in. I think, well, during my schooling, it was relatively none. But um, outside of my schooling hours, I was working two, three days a week. Sometimes part time. You know, not. Not full days sometimes if you had the patients or not for to treat. Were you working two to three days a week while you were in the PA school? No. No, I ended up. So, uh, am I correct that in 2014 you were licensed in Nevada as a physician assistant? Correct. And you were also licensed as a practitioner of homeopathy in Nevada? Correct, yes. And I was originally licensed uh, with the homeopathic board, I think it was 2008. Have you practiced it continuously since then? No, I'm not currently practicing any homeopathic right now. When did you uh, cease practicing homeopathic work? When I graduated uh, physician assistant school. And uh, in addition to physician assistant, mm -hmm. homeopathic, and chiropractic, do you have any other professional credentials? I do not. In your current employment, I believe you said it's in uh, Nevada? Yes, it is. Who is your current employer? It's a group called Sweetwater Pain and Spine. It's a pain PM&R, phys uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation clinic. How long have you been working there? I was, this is my second week. Where were you working before Sweetwater? Uh, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Is that a tribal operation? A tribal operation, correct. How long did you work there? I think eight months as a chiropractor and a PA. Before that, where did you work? Before that, I had a really short stint working for the CVS Minute Clinic right when I graduated PA school. I think I only, I only worked for them for about four months, approximately. I don't remember, maybe close to a year. Have these jobs, have they been full time? The CVS Minute Clinic job was considered full time at 32 hours per week. They didn't offer any. They didn't offer more than that. And the the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and the Sweetwater. Those, those are both full time jobs. Yes. And uh, can you describe for us in these jobs the mix of chiropractic and uh, a physician assistant work? Currently at Sweetwater, Pan is fine. There is no chiropractic care delivered. Uh, my current boss, with the current status that I'm in, with my license, he doesn't feel comfortable. <laughs> moving forward with my chiropractic license, even though I have been licensed in the state of Nevada for, I can't remember how many years, but quite a few years. Um, he, he just would like this probationary status to be kind of be done with and moved on. So he just feels more comfortable as my employer to move, to move forward with me. And I would love that as an opportunity to do both there because in pain management, a lot of it's just neck and back pain, all of its musculoskeletal treatments. 
How about at uh, Reno Sparks? Did you do any chiropractic there? I did. I did two days a week of chiropractic and three days a week of medical. And at CVS, did you do any chiropractic? No, all medical. Uh, during your first year of the PA program, mm -hmm. did you do any chiropractic in California? In 2012, just my one day a month. Because the program allowed me to still live in Reno, Nevada. I didn't have to go to um, North Dakota full time. Was That's, it distance learning? They don't really call it distance lear learning because I do go. I did go on campus five months out of the two-year program. And when I went on campus, I'd go for approximately a month, about four weeks. And then I'd go back to Reno, do all my clinical hours, and then I'd end up going back to, to campus. So it's partially distance learning. Um, in your letter to the board, mm -hmm. I'm looking, uh, I looked for this at uh, the page stamped BCE 11. Um, you wrote that, quote, my original violation involved an accusation of unprofessional conduct, unquote. Right. Give you a chance to find that. Mm -hmm. See the BCE eleven. Yeah. Eleven. Okay. okay. Um, second paragraph. Yes. Yes. Um, what did you mean by that? That there I just, was an accusation of unprofessional conduct. I just wanted a list there so the board knew how to access my case easily. Just kind of have something in there because um, I didn't put it on the top of the as a, as a header of kind of my case number. So I just wanted to put that in there so they can easily understand where I'm coming from or in, and find my case. Well, what uh, uh, I'd like to get at though is. Are you only admitting that you were accused of unprofessional conduct? Or? Oh no, I I admit I you know I went through the whole process of admitting um, the guilt of, of going you know of practicing the way I practiced working for Dr. Wickham at that time. What yeah. what, what was if you could just state it succinctly? Yeah. I don't need a, a long explanation, okay. but it, I'm sure you thought about it over the years. Yeah. Could you state succinctly what was unprofessional about your conduct that that led to your Revocation. According to the well, um, what I personally felt as I, as it being unprofessional was not necessary, not necessarily the actual treatment at hand, but maybe how the whole thing kind of put itself together, and how we attracted patients. Um, on our advertising methods for fibromyalgia. I, and I think he even stated in some of his advertising, it was like a cure to fibromyalgia. Um, and so when these patients came into the clinic, it was a very short course of, because a lot of them lived from out of state. And so he put a plan together to where, okay, if you're coming in, we're gonna put together a very, very short course of treatment for you for maybe a month or two, but we're gonna see you many, many times during that uh, time period while you're here. And that consisted of multiple treatments through the, you know, in, in a day's course of work. So we would see some of these patients one or two times, maybe even up to three times in a single day for approximately one month to two months, depending how they were doing. Um, so as for, it was unprofessional to treat those patients in a manner that was not approved by the board. That was kind of out of the scope of how we take care of patients. Mm -hmm. So that was more or less unprofessional about it. As for the, my, the way I took care of the patients was never un, unprofessional how I treated them and talked to them. It was more or less just the scope of what we did. I, I, I'm not as familiar probably as most members of the board are mm -hmm. with the, the, the limits on practice and what the mm -hmm. board would authorize, but could you tell us what was unprofessional about the program of treatment, if anything, 
that was rendered to those fibromyalgia patients. Giving these patients a, a hopeful uh, end date to maybe what they're dealing with. Um, now I'm not necessarily, I went along with the program. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who created it. I went, I worked for a guy who created this program and I went along with it. That's my poor judgment of going with a chiropractor that has set up a program that that's more where my downfall was, that's where my first mistake was. And, and as I was going in and working with these, um, with the patients, even though I felt like a majority of them were getting well and they were getting help, um, it's still, he, he provided a, uh, a sense of, you come here, we will help you, you're gonna get well from this debilitating sickness uh, through the methods that I've created. And, more or less promising these patients this. And, and so there, there was the unprofessionalism of promising these high lofty goals for these patients where in reality, not everybody got well. Not everybody you know, had a cure. Uh, some people did, some, well, some people got better. Whether they were cured or not, I, I wasn't there for you know, long enough time to follow up with any of these patients. So, so it's unprofessional in that manner. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Those are all the questions I have. Okay, uh, questions from the board, and if you would just state your name for the benefit of the court reporter. Sir, Sir Joe Azzolino. So, Dr. Brady, uh, who yes. rendered any oversight at, on the chiropractic care that you were providing at the Reno Sparks Tribal Operation? Yes. Was anybody rendering any oversight on that, or were you... Uh, no, the medical person? director had oversight over me, even though it was a non-chiropractor. He was more or less the director of all medical or any therapies under, the, under that roof. And you were there for eight months, correct? Uh, approximately, yeah. Can you give me an idea on what your services uh, consisted of, patients? Under, so? under my chiropractic yes. realm? So... We split it up to where I only saw chiropractic patients two days out of the week. Um, and I had one room to provide those services out of. I had a, a table that had drop and some flexion and distraction. I had a hydroculator available to me and I had a intersegmental traction table. So as the patients came in for neck or back or whatever they're um, coming in for, I would treat them in those fashions. My schooling is a hands-on method as I adjust. You know, I, I adjust um, with a uh, Palmer method, hands-on method. And then if I, use, if I wanted to use any modalities, whether I want to use the intersegmental traction, I would maybe put the patients on that, uh, pre or post adjusting, or I'd put them on heat. And that was basically the extent of my treatments. Okay. And I would only see them I never put anybody on regimented treatment plans, um, and since I was only doing it two days a week, some patients would see me, um, you know, a couple of those days, and then, you know, for maybe a couple of weeks, and then if I've gotten better, then I'd just release them. And according to your testimony, you have only been treating a colleague or two and your wife and Correct. kids in California? Correct. Once a month? Yeah. Have you seen any new patients at all? Have no. you done any insurance building? Have you done no. had any oversight on no. any other cases at all? No, because ever since I was, um, since the original accusation during that time period in 2010, 12, mm -hmm. uh, I was already li a licensed chiropractor in the state of Nevada. And my family lived in the state of Nevada in the Reno area. so. I could never really put too much time and attention in building any kind of practice. I just wanted to satisfy the, uh, well, what I needed to do for the California side. And that's what I just kept on doing. Have you contemplating seeking any employment as a chiropractor in California? <sighs> Not currently, just because my wife's a practicing chiropractor also in the state of Nevada, and I'm very settled in 
the Reno area, I have two children that are deep into the system, school system and sports and things. So, so is it correct that once a month you would just literally drive over the border just to render an adjustment? That's it. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that your current employer is contemplating uh, incorporating chiropractic in, into the current uh, practice model. Yeah, we have, we've had some discussions on it. Um, he did not reference that at all in his letter. Um, do you know the reason for that? No. I told him just to keep it very general. Okay. And what are your long-term plans with working at Sweetwater? My long-term plans is, number one, to stay with that company for a good long time. I, I feel like I'm, uh, there's four providers in the clinic. I feel like I add a, uh, a good piece of the puzzle, and I would like to, and he's open to it also, to add that chiropractic piece to offer the patients other modalities of treatment. And are you planning on practicing with your wife? No. Okay. No further questions. I'm Julie Elginer. Uh, the questions I have, uh, Dr. Brady, you mentioned in your opening statement that you were denied employment in FDIC clinic as a result of, okay, and also that uh, you're looking to be removed from the medical exemption list, medical exemption list as a result. I noticed that you you did not mention anything about the current employment consideration, like specifically about the fact that your employer mm -hmm. it sounds as though, based on your testimony that there's they also have an incentive or an interest in getting your probation removed that's yeah so he just doesn't feel you know me being on probation and understanding he just doesn't feel comfortable with moving forward with uh, that license he's very comfortable with me being a PA in the clinic uh, he just doesn't feel comfortable yet as me being a chiropractor in the clinic due to Maybe the red tape or the hurdles I'm going to have to jump through as for getting credentials with all the insurers and going through um, more processes due to the, the probationary status that I'm on. And he just would feel just more comfortable if I just didn't, wasn't on that status, you know, just as a fully um, unrestricted chiropractor. Um, even though it's in this different state, he, I, I mean, he knows that I'm not restricted at all in the state of Nevada, and I have um, fully unrestricted license in the state of Nevada, but he just, you know, even though he just feel, would feel more comfortable okay. if it was removed. So I, I was just curious why you didn't mention that in your opening statement, and it only came up through questioning. In my, regarding the... In your prepared statement, I was uh -huh. just a little bit curious why you didn't offer that. You offered up the fact uh -huh. that you were denied employment through FDIC clinic, that you wanted to come up the Medi-Cal exclusion list. I was just curious why you didn't bring that forward voluntarily. It only came out that your employer feels that way through questioning. Um, well, I are you referring to the one that you received earlier? No, the I'm one referring that to my testimony. Mean, yeah, so I piece mealed that together this morning, just trying to get everything out there as much as I can. I wanted to be open about it. Um, okay, so I there's no to, reason why you didn't for, like, no, offer that up initially? Not at all. I mean, I would have, I could have <clears throat> changed the way I kind of, my opening statement would. Yeah, I, I have nothing to hide on that <laughs> at all. So, and please understand that we're asking, because our job is consumer protection. Absolutely. Right? Okay. I understand that. So, the other question that I wanted to ask was in regards to your, um, this is on bait stamp uh, page four. So, this is information that you offer as you are completing the petitioner packet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, number 10, <clears throat> and Mr. Dracar asked about this, but I'm going to ask a follow-up yes. question. I've established safeguards to prevent repetition of the original violations, and you were describing, as a result of Mr. Drakkar's questioning, mm -hmm. the concerns around advertising, right? That you're going to have colleagues review potential advertising. I would. Just the reason why I have that in there is because the original violation was also an advertising thing. So I just wanted to make right. sure that... And this is mm. this is my question. Oh, okay. The advertising component Correct. is very small relative to the other violations that are in the original fourth the, the fourth cause for discipline. 
It was fails to substantiate the medical necessity of repeated mm -hmm. care, um, excessive treatment, developing a treatment plan, lack of detailed re-examinations. I'm more concerned about the safeguards that you are mm -hmm. that you would have in place for those types of things rather than the advertising. Okay. So Appreciate the fact that, that you are only speaking of the fact that you're planning to have safeguards in place for the advertising is a bit of a concern for me. So I'd like you to describe that. Well, I don't think I completely referred to that as, as just as an advertising thing. I, I kind of wanted to make that as more of a generalized statement, even though it was under just one number, number 10. Um, but that's so that for the first sentence, I have established safeguards to prevent repetition of the original violation. What I meant by that was the entire violation, not just advertising. But if we were to review the records, mm -hmm. in the when Mr. Dakar asked you about it, the mm -hmm. only thing that you offered forward in mm -hmm. terms of the safeguards that you have in place is to have colleagues review advertising. There was no mention of the other components. Well, I thought that's what he was just referring to. That's why I asked. That's why I just, I thought that he was referring to the advertising methods. I have my own personal safeguards that I have built in in my own personal practice to make sure that I go through every one of those uh, policies so I, and procedures correctly. So, uh, you know, so I document correctly. I take the time with the patients. I put, you know, if there's a plan that I need to see the patient for long term, I'll put that plan together these days. So, as so that's a, what I'd like to hear about. Absolutely. These okay. other violations that, you know, you said that you absolutely. admitted to, mm -hmm. the repeated care, the excessive treatment, right. the treatment, lack of a treatment plan, and the detailed reexamination. Right. Could you describe the safeguards that you have in place mm -hmm. to make sure that those do not happen again? Right. So, currently within my, I don't practice chiropractic at Suit Water Pain and Spine, but if I did do that, I would have regular protocols um, or typical protocols that most chiropractors should abide by, and that is making sure your notes are legible, completed, make sure that you're practicing within the guidelines of, of practice, plans in place if they need to be in place. I mean, I, I would have all of that. It was just that the time that I was working for Wickham, he didn't have those in place. And I had a bad judgment call of kind of following suit. And I admit to following suit with bad protocols. And ever since then, since 2000, when I ended up being a play with him, um, I have been, I mean, it's, I've done everything that I can to practice safe for my patients, making sure that I'm within standards, within, you know, I don't do anything that I would feel like that's out of the ordinary scope of a chiropractor to put myself at risk at all. I would never do that ever again to myself based on what has happened over the last five to six years of my life. Okay, thank you. I have no yeah. further questions. Good afternoon, <coughs> good afternoon Dr. Brady. Hi, good afternoon. Quick question for you, just yes. a clarification question, just to be sure that your petition, uh, which you submitted, BCE page two, <coughs> the, the, third, the third questions, the third question asks, quote, have you ever had disciplinary action taken against any professional license in this state or any other state? And you answer no. Is that accurate? Since, so this was 8 18, 2005. So it's not necessarily accurate. So in the state of Nevada, what they do is, um, so I apologize that maybe I should have, and I think I have originally stated yes on past um, of these quarterly statements um, and writing down that since an action occurs in the state of California, Nevada automatically um, takes a similar action against the licensing. So, um, so, if you, if, so if I went on Nevada, so I had to go ahead when they, when they found out about my action from California, they had to take a very similar action because it's what we call like a sister state. So they, they also made me retake their jurisprudence and exam, examination 
and and technically it is a, um, a disciplinary action also in the state of Nevada, even though the action didn't occur in Nevada, but they take a similar stance on it. So um, does that answer your question on that? Yeah, it or, sounds like it should have been probably yes, and not probably. Yeah, yes, yes, it, 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 yes, yes. Because if you go onto the Nevada uh, board website and you go into the disciplinary action and look me up, it will state disciplinary action, and then it'll basically just take this whole case on a PDF and pull it up. Okay, thank you. No yes. further question. Good afternoon, Dr. Dion McClain. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Gray. Um, I have a few follow-up questions um, here. Uh, let's see. Earlier, you mentioned in your testimony that you plan on paying the rest of the balance of the the amount due to the board by the end of this month. Correct. How do you plan on paying that in a lump sum? How do you plan on paying lump sum? Okay. Um, additionally, earlier you were just uh, I. I think Dr. Azzolino asked you a question regarding your, your previous work and you were working at a clinic for two days a week. Um, you, you mentioned the clinic that you were working at two days a week, chiropractically. Two, two to three. Two to three days it was a, a week. It was a variable schedule, so okay. it would, it would, it would anywhere and, from two to four. And at that clinic, um, your testimony um, seemed to, to um, suggest that you were not you did not have treatment plans there either. No, but my I did a lot of homeopathic care there, which the medical doctor who had already he would have a treatment plan already for them in place. And so basically the way they operated there is if that patient needed to be referred internally referred to me because the patient now has maybe some neck pain, I would go ahead and treat that patient's neck pain, but it was never a long-term thing. So I wouldn't have to put together very long-term plans. It was more or less just um, acute care treatments. Do you understand that a treatment plan does not have to be long-term? Correct. I do. I do. So I, I consider it acute, more acute care plans. So if I saw them three to five times. And as a part of your previous um, Disciplinary actions. Mm -hmm. One of that, those uh, were based on your not having treatment plans and excessive treatment. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, what are you going to do in the future to rectify that? Because clearly, it sounds like uh, it what, hasn't been rectified. Well, I haven't. I've been in school for a very long period of time, and I haven't been doing a lot of chiropractic. But I do. I do put people on plans as as if per diagnosis. So if the patient comes to me and says, "Hey, I've had a chronic." low back for 20 plus years, I would, I would be suggestive on certain plans for that patient and, and ask them, you know, what plans do, do they think that would be um, that they can more or less uh, abide by. And some of those are like, would you, do you need to just come in, you know, from, from do you want to just kind of come in when you're feeling not well and I'll adjust you, or would you like something you know, a little bit more structured. And so I would go along those lines and, and put pay patients on plans. Okay, I'm going to see you a couple times a week for two to three weeks, and then let's see how you do. And if you're feeling better, why don't we scale you back? So those would be, that would be like a typical structured care plan for myself. Do you, would you, or do you anticipate giving a structured plan mm -hmm. for any patient that comes in or every yes. patient that comes in? Yes. Um, okay, I have just uh, one or a couple other things. Um, when were you licensed as a, a homeopathic press practitioner? It was 2008. Yeah, right, right around there. And what is the difference, in your opinion, of getting a patient well and curing a patient? My personal definition of getting someone well, somebody getting somebody to get somebody just out of pain, say they're coming in for chronic back pain, getting somebody out of their current syndrome of pain more on a subjective level, would I, I would say that that would be moving towards the wellness side. I don't currently believe there's a, 
more or less a cure for many things. Um, Do you feel that there's a cure for fibromyalgia? No, I don't. Do you? I think we could be, get people well from it and feeling better. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Thank okay, you. thank you. I have no question. I have no question. I got one additional follow-up question, just mm -hmm. to be clear, Dr. Brady. Okay. Um, you made a couple of reference, I think, during your presentation and during the questioning about the remaining balance. And you said yes. that if I misquoted that the lump sum payment uh, will be paid by the end of this month. And right. just to be clear, I want to make sure that's regardless of the outcome of today's... Regardless. I plan on paying it off. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anything else from the board members? Uh, Dr. Reddy, anything uh, you wanted to add? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. What's the uh, Attorney General's position? Uh, the Attorney General's position on behalf of the people um, is that uh, uh, he has not done much chiropractic work uh, to demonstrate his rehabilitation um, under the period. Uh, he has a five-year period of probation. He's only exhausted half of it, and it seems only technically by doing coming across the border to do adjustments. Um, I don't think that he has much of a track record of success uh, or of uh, you know um, having mended his ways and his practice methods. Um, so uh, it would be in the uh, seem to be in the interest of the people to have him continue on probation and to serve the full uh, probationary term. Thank you. Right, Dr. Brady, uh, yes. your final closing remarks. I personally do feel like I'm rehabilitated from his efforts, even though a portion of those years were spent in school where I did not perform many chiropractic treatments. I feel the work that he did in mostly Nevada, partially in California, and would substantiate for the release of my probation so I can move forward professionally. Uh, I did take a couple years off on the tolling status, which kind of put me back a couple years, but in the long stretch of things, it's been since I've been since the since 2010, um, since I've been on probation, I feel like during those those years I have done what it takes to um, professionally um, make myself clear that I'm not at harm and that to, to patients in my community and that I can provide safe methods of not only medicine but chiropractic care to my community. I feel like as a chiropractor that holds a active license in both states currently that I shouldn't be held back at all to um, be able to move forward and remove some of those uh, obstacles to, to do that. And I feel like with this status that I'm currently on, it, it is a big obstacle or a big uh, for, for myself to move forward. I understand it is two more years, but it's two more years of my life and a professional career that I wish I could not have to have those barriers removed and be able to continue what we do, and that's provide health care to our community. And I don't, I don't feel like I'm at risk by any means to my community, to anyone that I serve. And I just feel, want to kind of feel like that I can move forward without that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, that concludes the hearing in this matter. The record is closed and the matter is submitted. You notified me a couple of weeks, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right.
All right, we are on the record. This is the matter of petition for reinstatement of Robert Glover. It's OH number 2016-090178, agency case number AC 2010-808. Today's date is October 14, 2016, hearing being held in San Diego, California. At for the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Adam Berg is the Administrative Law Judge from the Office of Administrative Hearings, hearing the case today with the Board. Counsel for the Attorney General's Office, please identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, I am Deputy Attorney General Ted Durkar. Okay, thank you. And to the petitioner, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Excuse me, Judge, I would want to recuse myself from this case. Okay. Um, you saw the quorum, right? Is that we do. Yes, okay. We do. Um, okay. You were here for the last uh, presentation, so you know that the, how the format is going to go. Um, if you have any questions that come up during the hearing, let me know, and uh, I can attempt to answer them for you. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Mr. Mm -hmm. Dekar. Okay. Uh, I'm appearing again on behalf of the Attorney General, uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. My role here is to protect the public interest. Um, the nature of our proceeding here is a petition for reinstatement by Robert Glover. Um, and I believe that you have a pre-marked exhibit package. Uh, the petition package will be, uh, I would request that it be exhibit one. Um, and uh, by way of background, uh, this is uh, respondent uh, or Robert Glover's uh, first hearing on a petition for reinstatement following his revocation. Um, Dr. Glover was first licensed as a chiropractor in uh, 2001. Dr. Glover began his practice on a probationary license due to a, a series of misdemeanor convictions. Uh, then he successfully completed probation in 2004. On uh, January 20th, 2011, an accusation was filed to revoke uh, Dr. Glover's license based upon allegations of unprofessional conduct, gross negligence, and repeated uh, DUIs. Uh, Dr. Glover contested the accusation, and he received a two-day hearing before an administrative law judge in November 2011. The administrative law judge rendered a decision recommending revocation, which was adopted by the board, it is in the petition package. Uh, the um, uh, board uh, adopted that decision, um, thereby revoking Dr. Glover's license on March 7, 2012. I would like to note that um, among the charged misconduct, the charge uh, concerning repeated DUI was not sustained. Uh, uh, as to the burden of proof, it is uh, Dr. Glover's burden to demonstrate that he is rehabilitated and that his license should be reinstated. Therefore, I have nothing further at this time, but I reserve the right to cross-examine him or call him if he chooses not to testify on his petition. Thank you. All right, Dr. Glover, do you have any additional evidence that you wish to be submitting that wasn't contained in the petition packet? Uh, no, sir. I believe I've submitted everything. In okay, then case. the petition packet is exhibit one and it will be received into evidence. Uh, do you have any witnesses today? No. Okay. Uh, if you would stand and raise your right hand, I will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you'll be giving? will be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. All right. This is your opportunity to tell the board why uh, it should grant your petition. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, board. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you for allowing me to present my case. Um, this is really challenging situation. I'm sorry I have to be here on this note. Um, I just want you to know it's been a pleasure and an honor. I'm thankful and grateful to have had been a chiropractor. I love being a chiropractor. It's awesome to be able to help people to heal and to feel better, to have better health and wellness. So it's been an honor. It's been one of my colleagues. I am by no means proud of the act I committed, what I did, I was wrong. I'm called to a higher standard. I hurt a person emotionally. I was negligent. 
I was given the privilege of being in a position of authority. And I abused that through my own stupidity and negligence. I don't take this at all lightly for what I did. I'm ashamed. I harmed a human being emotionally, my patient. I care for all of my patients. I'm a caring person, competent. I've taken a lot of action to help people through a myriad of different things. But regarding this incident, in my office that I worked so hard to build, my holistic health practice to help people, I failed. And I did not render the standard of care that's expected amongst us chiropractors, licensed doctors. I practiced inappropriately. I was negligent. I rendered a very sloppy treatment and I engaged sexual misconduct. You know, I'm sorry for the shame um, and disrespect I brought to our profession, the shame I brought to myself and my family. I'm sorry for what I've done. And I have no excuses. I, I, I was, I should never have treated this patient. I should never have treated this patient. I tried to treat all my patients. I, I kept my doors open, I laid down, I fell asleep, and I should have told my patient when she woke me up on my table, I'm sorry, Glory, I cannot treat you. But I tried my best to be the chiropractor that I've always aspired to be, and I went ahead asleep in a droggy state, and I really just not the right standard of care. I kept my office doors open. All my rooms in my office have always been open because I have an open practice. There's nothing to hide. I had no intent on doing anything inappropriate. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. I'm not that type of person. But I'm responsible. I made the mistake. That being said and done, I, I don't blame my patient for reporting. I'm, I'm the kind of person, citizen, that stands up for people's rights. And having to pay the price, and rightfully so, I have done my best, board, to um, rehabilitate myself. I have paid restitution to the patient, first and foremost. I have been paying back my recovery costs. It has not been easy. I have taken massive action for to rehabilitate myself. I know I've had a problem with alcoholism. for a variety of reasons. But professionally, I'm crystal clear about rendering my services as a chiropractor and doing my do what I've worked so hard for. I love being a chiropractor. But to stay healthy, I have taken massive action for it because I know that's a big concern. That was one of the reasons I was put on a probation off a license in the first place because I got a DUI back in 1987. And then I graduated from chiropractic college in 1994. 1999, rather, I'm sorry. Since I have been, I had to close my practice. Um, this accusation came about, the accusation, the event occurred in Jan uh, July of 2007. And I'm practicing five years, and then later on this comes up. Over time, when I had to close my office, I, well, I started getting help back in November of 2009 through my church, through Celebrate Recovery. 
which I also have been a volunteer in that program and helping other people going through recovery. I've attended a lot of AA meetings, 150 plus over the years. I also want to learn more about this problem because I've seen it in my patients and people out in the world. I obtained a degree in alcohol, other drugs from Saddleback College in the interim. I finished that program in 2013. I also got involved in a program called Smart Recovery, which is another option to help people going through recovery who do not want to do AA or celebrate recovery. It's a very great program. I'm a facilitator in that program. Over the years, I have been getting um, counseling from a licensed um, psychologist, Dr. Laird Bridgman, who I started seeing back in November of 2009 mainly because I was very depressed over the years. But I'm not here to offer excuses about my well-being. The standard issue here that's at stake is the safety of the public, which I understand. Forgive me for not knowing exactly how to approach this situation. I'm um, disappointed in myself, um, chiropractic board. In regards to patient handling, I have learned a lot about boundaries over the years because I have been the type of chiropractor that, as a solo chiropractor, really gave it my all to help a lot of my patients. I built a nice little energy wellness center, holistic health care, mind, body, spirit. I was very proud of the practice I built and where I placed in Irvine, California, and being able to help people with a, a variety of different issues as their chiropractic doctor. I took pride in that, and I, I'm proud of being a chiropractor. But I understand as a chiropractor, there's a boundary, and I cross that boundary when I inintentionally, in a droggy state, did something I shouldn't have done. Not knowing that this is a human being who may have a past, have a history, I did something that triggered something. People are dealing with things all the time. And as a professional, I need to be careful about the boundaries we can cross as licensed professionals. I cross the boundaries. It wasn't intentional in my treatment. It was a mistake. But in the process of rendering treatment, exposing my patient's breasts, who knows what that person was thinking? I failed to render the standard of care. That was inappropriate of me. I was not intentional by no means whatsoever. As I said before, I should never, ever have treated this patient. She wasn't even scheduled. And I had one more patient left on that Friday night. I understand boundaries. That's why I want you to know. I understand we are given the highest level of um, responsibility. And we have to respect how we handle our patients. The drug and alcohol program that they offer at the um, San Diego uh, Saddleback College is awesome because as a drug and alcohol counselor, it really teaches you a lot about ethics and boundaries. And I've learned a lot more about that. And I really have reflected on my behavior and how I need to safeguard my actions at all times. Trying to run a practice as a solo practitioner has not been easy. And I should have actually had full-time staff with me. That's another area that I neglected. I mean, I've heard about that, you know, being the only one in the, in the building by yourself is not wise. And I should have had staff member with me all the time. And I do have a plan 
if I'm granting my license back. I please understand, I do have a plan. And I want you to know I'm very aware of how I need to be practicing and the safety and accountability. And I'll go into that in a little bit. I realize with my record, there's going to be several issues that are going to pop up that I'm sure our counselor here is going to um, pull up. That's his job, which I understand. I want you to know that I'm willing to do whatever it takes within reason to be responsible, accountable. I made some mistakes. Um, the DUIs, I had a drinking problem that has been resolved. I've received treatment. I've been in recovery. I have an accountability team. I have people in my life today that I can count on, that I surround myself with. My family has been awesome. I got married uh, June 16, 2012. I've known my wife, who's behind me here, for eight, nine years. Uh, we met at my church. She's been a great support. And so are the people at my church and my small group, um, my counselor. I have a team in place. Forgive me for bouncing back and forth, because I know part of the issue here is, one, is the safety of the public, which I totally understand. I totally get that. And when you look at my track re record, the things I've done to volunteer, I'm not here to brag on my volunteer history, but I've been very active over the last 23 years volunteering. I'm a missionary. I'm an ordained pastor. Praise God. I'm about to complete seminary, praise God. I've been involved in a master's degree program, and I have one more week to go, and I will be soon be finishing with my seminary program. These are some of the things I've been doing. I'm always serving in the community. And I've helped out, out, out at Katrina, Alabama, when those tornadoes hit, been to Haiti. I help out locally, painting houses in Los Angeles community. That's just because that's the right thing to do. That is what God has told me, and that's what I do as a citizen. But as a chiropractor, I made a mistake. And I'm really sorry that I hurt this person, everyone. I don't take this lightly. I would like to go back on probation. I would like to get my license restored. I would like to work out a, a payment plan. I submitted a letter regarding what I owe. I plan on paying whatever I have to pay for the recovery costs. That's in a separate letter. I'm willing to abide by the board's uh, recommendations um, for probation, because I understand if I am granted my license back, which I hope I am, I will be placed on probation. And when I do get my license back, if that's what you uh, determine, which I hope you do, I realize I need to either practice with a, a group of chiropractors, or if I go solo, I need to make sure I have a full-time staff person with me at all times in the building, and not wearing too many different hats trying to run my practice being a Chiropreneur, I love being a chiropractor, folks. I'm a great chiropractor. I've worked really hard. I've gotten fellows in international pediatric chiropractic care, sports chiropractic care. I've been certified in the Nemo Trigger Technique. I have a variety of techniques I love practicing because it's tools we can use to help remove those subluxations. I look at the person from mind, body, spirit, from their nose to their toes. I'm not here to cure anything. God does the healing, but I'm the facilitator. I'm a healer because that's my gifting, folks. But I have to play by the rules. And I made a mistake, which will never happen again. So I'm sure I'll be given an opportunity to address any questions you have. Uh, dear board, um, I'm at your mercy. And I'm praying 
that you will give me another chance and allow me to get my license back on probationary terms and restore my license and let me know what I must do to earn that right back. <clears throat> Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you for taking my case and allowing me to present it. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Dick. Yes, D Dr. Glover, since your license uh, was revoked, have you been arrested or convicted for any offense other than a traffic violation? No, sir. Uh, and were you first licensed to practice chiropractic in 2001? Yes. Did you start your practice on probation? Yes, I did. Why is that? Well, initially I agreed to accept a license and then I didn't realize once you get your license, they immediately revoke it. They put it on probationary terms, but that was the agreement. I said, I'm more than happy to take a license on probationary status. Why, what, what was it though that led to your having to be on probationary status? I believe the board uh, had looked at um, my past history um, when I was younger and I had made some mistakes, some minor misdemeanors, and I had a DUI in 1987. So as a precaution, the state was doing their duty to make sure that they were licensing uh, the individual who they could give license to. So I accepted that. What was uh, the date of your last misdemeanor uh, prior to your seeking licensure as a chiropractor? The date of my last misdemeanor prior to seeking licensure? Uh, that would have been, I believe, that would have been the, the DUI um, in 1987. All right, I'm looking at page BCE. 154 of your stipulation and agreement. Uh, this is in the packet. Uh, it's the first page of the stipulation and agreement for issuance of probationary license. And uh, I'm looking there in the first paragraph. Do you have the package with you? You can look at mine. That'll help you along here. Look at the first paragraph. Close all the uh, it indicates uh, yeah, right. misdemeanor conviction for 23152A, which is driving under the influence, in 1997. Okay, I got the year wrong. I say 87, I meant 97. I'm sorry. And you remained on probation then for three years until 2004, is that correct? Yes. All right. And the unprofessional conduct that resulted in your revocation, it related to a, a patient. Well, and that was about three years after you got off the probation that was at the start of your chiropractic career, right? The um, 4, 2004, yes, that would be approximately about three, three and a half years, yes. How many times had you treated uh, Ms. Before the incident, um, I treated her approximately 90 three times, quite a bit. All right, and uh, could you describe for us uh, what you did to Ms. that was inappropriate? Sure. Um, I, in the process of uh, adjusting my pa uh, patient, getting ready to treat her, I was not paying attention when I laid her on the table and I had laid her down, I was getting ready to place this device called Infratronic, which is a, a low frequency sound wave machine that I place on a lot of my patients' thymus gland on their chest. And in the process of laying her down, I, because I was asleep and droggy, I actually had pulled up her shirt and pulled it up too far and was unaware of doing so and placed it on her chest and proceeded to palpate her neck. When I sat back down, I listened through my hands and I didn't even realize that I had actually pulled up her shirt because I was just, it was, I wasn't awake. I was in such a hurry and I was so disappointed that I had been found asleep. But that's what I did. All right, I'm looking at the uh, decision of the administrative law judge that was adopted by the board, specifically at page BCE 124 of this uh, hearing package. Um, and uh, there, the ALJ uh, uh, determined or writes that uh, Dr. Glover unbuttoned um, 
blouse and removed her, her bra, exposing her breasts. He then placed his palms on her breasts, moves his hands down to an area above her waist, and then back up to her breasts. He repeated this action two more times uh, and uh, noted there was no appropriate chiropractic purpose for this behavior. There was expert testimony about this uh, at, the, uh, at the hearing in November 2011. Um, do, do, you, do you admit or do you, do you dispute that you unbuttoned her blouse? No, I, I do admit I did unbutton the, the top of her blouse. Yes, I did. Okay. And exposed her breasts, removed her bra? I, not like it's written, no. I did not do that like it's written. No, sir. What, ha what actually happened? Well, as I, I'll explain it again, um, part of her treatment, it consisted of a combination of soft tissue work to her pectoralis muscle based on the diagnosis I had given her. Um, to get to the area up here, and I have done this before, with her permission, soft tissue work on the pectoralis region there. Um, as I mentioned, I had laid her on the table, and I had placed the, in the process of placing the infratronic on her diaphragm, on the chest area to get to her thymus, I had pulled up her shirt, placing that diaphragm, the infratronic, on her thymus gland, and then I proceeded to go ahead and do some soft tissue work on her neck area as well as her upper chest area, which I have done before. Do you agree that you did run your palms across her breasts several times? I went over her upper chest, and that's what she indicated in her very first police report that I had massaged her pectoralis muscle. Her very first police report, she had mentioned that when she reported this to the police. That was not, um, there was a lot of little details brought up, but that was the very first police report. So the information you get them right there has been watered down, the information has been miscommunicated. I'm not here to defend, it was inappropriate for me to even make that mistake. But I need to make sure that things have been taken out of um, context over and over. Her police, her police report, she mentioned that I had massaged her pectoralis muscles. She has rounded shoulders, um, tight muscles, she has FHP, forward head posture, tight scaling muscles, it's part of my diagnosis with her thoracic outlet syndrome. Do you deny having uh, rubbed her breasts? Not talking about her pectoralis muscles, I'm talking about her breasts. Do you not deny having done that? I went over her, uh, I went over the top portion of her breasts, just because that's a portion over here, you know, of her chest muscles. In terms of her nipples and areas like that, as she indicated in the police report, I didn't have manipulate her nipples. No, that would be totally just out of the, out of the norm. You, you indicated in your uh, testimony you were asleep and groggy that you had no intent that this conduct was a, was a mistake. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, what part of the, of the work that you just described with the pectoralis muscles, what part of that was a mistake? Well, it's not my norm to disrobe any patient. Uh, and there was no intention on disrobing her. I laid her down too fast, too quick. I was still asleep. So it's inappropriate to ever expose a patient's body parts, um, especially if you, you, they don't know what you're doing. I totally get that. So my patient, I understand she would have been in shock because that's not a normal procedure. I was not myself. I was still asleep. I didn't even know that I had really done that because I was going so fast and just out of it. And when I realized her breasts were exposed, I quickly covered them back up. But that's not a, a normal treatment. I was wrong, and that was just inappropriate. And in being wrong like that, I should have immediately taken responsibility. And although I have a little familiarity with this patient because I've handled her so many times over the years, that's no excuse. That was not the standard of care. I had no problem when I went to court stating I did remove her shirt unintentionally. The patient wasn't even scheduled to come in. There was only one other patient. She came in. I don't refuse my patients. And she came in and claimed she sat in my massage chair, which my patients do. 
when they come in, they sit in the massage chair in the lobby, and she noticed I was not coming out as I normally do because I had laid down to take a power nap for my next patient. And unfortunately, I dozed off much deeper than I thought. Then when she came in, I was just embarrassed, shocked, and had rushed to do the treatment. I wasn't even awake. I should never have treated her. And I did not fully know what I was doing in the process of trying to give her care, counsel. So she was on a table when this happened? Yes. After she got up off the table, did you do anything else to her that was inappropriate? Well, I always check um, alignment of the pelvis. I look at the neck and I also look at the feet alignment. So I had um, uh, checked her feet and then I went ahead and rendered adjustment to her thoracic area, her lumbar area. Those are hard to adjust. She's a, a heavy set lady. Um, I did a pectoral stretch, had her hold her hands behind her head and stretch her pecs. And I did a standing thoracic adjustment. And I, I did give her a hug. And I kissed her on the cheek and told her to have a good day, a good night. Was that inappropriate? No. It was appropriate? Or I, I'm asking, was it inappropriate? What was, what, what was the specific thing you're talking about? To kiss her on the cheek. Um, I have kissed a lot of my patients on the cheek and given them brotherly or a uh, hug and a goodbye. I think it was nothing sexual. So for me, the type of person I am, I give people hugs. Uh, sometimes I'll kiss some of my patients on the forehead, on the cheek. They know me. These are people who know me. So I'm not going to sit up here and go, oh, you don't do that. That's a boundary probably I need to change. But in all honesty, I, I have kissed people. I'm not going to say that I don't. I've kissed both men and women on their cheek. I'm that type of person. It's part I kiss people in my church. Had you, do you see a distinction between kissing people in your church and kissing people at your uh, health care practice? Absolutely, I do. I shouldn't have done that. What, what's, the, what's the distinction and what's the reason for it? Well, what I've learned, um, Board, is that although it's nice to be friendly and caring, there's a certain line that I, I need to improve upon, and that is um, being overly friendly. I'm there to be their doctor and not their friend. And although I've been friendly with lots of my patients, and they know the good works I do, there's a line that I cross. And that's one um, habit that I need to change. There was nothing sexual or intended with that. And she even brought that up, as I'm sure you're going to bring up, when they did the covert phone call. She was kind of surprised that I made no advances at her. Uh, at the hearing on your accusation in November, 2011, you denied engaging in any mis sexual misconduct, didn't you? At the hearing, yes, I did. And you, you testified that you did not expose her breasts or touch them, and you denied kissing her too, didn't you? I don't think I said that I did not expose her breasts because that was already out that I already had admitted that I exposed her breasts accidentally. And I wasn't fully um, uh, aware of the definition of, of sexual misconduct because there's an intention that's involved which was lacking because I never had any intention. Did, didn't you deny uh, kissing her? I don't recall. There were so many things going on. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't taken out of context. But I want the board to know because it's in writing, it was taken out of context. Well, you're saying that the ALJ, when he writes here, this is at page BCE 133 in uh, paragraph 31. It's the middle of the page in 133. He wrote in summary of your testimony that you testified that you did not kiss her on the cheek at the conclusion of the treatment. Are you saying he got that wrong? That you did deny it? Counselor, you know, there's been so many things that happened. What I do know, and God is my witness, um, there was no, I, I might have kissed her, I might not have kissed her. You know, I am very friendly with a lot of 
people patience. And there's no sexual kiss. So when you read that and you're trying to make it seem like there's like a sexual kiss, that's not the case here. So I'm, I have no problem saying I have kissed people on the cheek on their head and told them to have a good day. And if that's against the crime, if that's wrong, then I'm guilty. Well, I'm looking at consistency here, trying to understand. You, you, you've stated here today that you did kiss her on the cheek, and um, the ALJ is indicating that in 2011, much closer to the incident, uh, that you, you denied uh, kissing her on the cheek. I, I, might have, I might have denied, you know, because there's a lot of information here I'm reading. Um, Whatever conclusion you want to take, sir, um, uh, I might have, I might not have, okay. Well, I, I, want, I, would, I would like you to provide us with the information. If you denied kissing her on the cheek at the conclusion of the treatment at your hearing in November 2011, was that a lie? No, it wasn't a lie. It was maybe not a good regulation of just remembering all the details because it's kind of insignificant. It was not no, no sexual kiss. So I... I'm sorry if it sounds like this. then I wasn't sure exactly how things were working. But in reading the report, it's, you know, I might have, I might have kissed her on the cheek. I know I've kissed other patients on the cheek, um, wishing them a good day in front of other people. Was uh, what you did to Ms. GM wrong because it violated professional standards? I'm talking about the whole office visit she had on that night in July 2007. Oh yes, yes. That was, I failed to render the standard of professional care, yes. Uh, aside from this standard of care, was it wrong for other reasons as well? Yes, that's, that's not the standard of care. Well, I mean, even if you weren't seeing her as a chiropractor, even if we didn't have these standards of care, did you do something to her that was wrong for anyone to do? No, I did not. It was only wrong because you were licensed as a chiropractor? I have a responsibility and I failed to render the standard of care. Um, if it was intentional, if I had planned on doing something, then it would be wrong. But since I did not plan on it and there was no intent, and I woke up and I was groggy and I should never have done that, um, it was a mistake, it was an accident. I, I clearly do not behave like going out here wanting to expose um, people um, and expose their their private parts, that's, uh, that's criminal, and I'm not a criminal, and I was, that's not what I intended to do, it was a mistake. So, you, you um, have said here today that you did engage in sexual misconduct, um, but you said earlier that what you did is only wrong because of, of professional standards. Are you saying that what you did towards Ms. GM would only qualify as sexual misconduct as a violation of standards of care for a chiropractor, but wasn't inherently wrong as sexual misconduct that anybody should refrain from? Well, well my understanding of, of sexual misconduct is the fact that I um, had exposed her breasts accidentally and proceeded to go forward with the treatment, that put that patient in a very vulnerable position. That the thing that was wrong, but that was not intentional. So I can never, that's, that's the truth right there. I, there was nothing intentional. There was no intention on wanting to expose this patient for any sexual gratification. They didn't want to see her breasts or anything. It was a pure mistake and accident in the process of rushing her treatment. So under that understanding, counselor, um, that's why I say it was sexual, engaging in sexual misconduct, because when I exposed her breasts accidentally, that changed the whole treatment. You have a patient now who is now exposed, and that can cause harm to the patient mentally. Um, who knows what they're thinking? And I'm responsible. I failed to render the standard of care. At the uh, uh, revocation hearing in 2011, and again here today, uh, you presented evidence of your rehabilitation from an alcohol uh, problem, correct? Yes. Um, and 
uh, believe that at the um, hearing in November 2011, you testified, uh, according to the administrative law judge's decision, uh, that you completed an AA program and attended AA meetings twice a week in 2010 and 2011. Is that right? You don't complete an AA program, you keep attending. So I've been attending AA. What step did you get to? I've been through all the steps. All 12? Yes, sir. Do you recall what the eighth step is? I believe the eighth step is to um, make amends. And uh, the, what's the one before that then, before making amends? The seventh step is to asking um, God to remove our character defects. And the eighth step, you make amends as long as with the person who you offended, as long as you don't bring harm to that person. So I was not able to make amends with the patient because it would be not appropriate to communicate with this person who has tried to sue me and who was hurt from this experience, which I understand. You said earlier uh, today that you paid restitution to the patient. Are you referring to? Yes. Could you describe the restitution that you paid? Sure. Um, the, the, the patient had sought out getting legal representation and uh, eventually we made an agreement to settle out of court to pay um, $10,000. That was the restitution right there. And I, you know, over time, paid the $10,000 or two according to our agreement. Do you have, uh, was there a judgment against you? No. Did you, did you fully pay the $10,000? Yes. Um, in regards to making amends uh, and for harm that you have done, what harm did you do in your chiropractic practice? What have you uh, admitted to yourself? The harm I did is failing to see that as a licensed practitioner, it's my responsibility to um, protect the practice, my patients, and make sure above all else, do no harm to any patient. The harm I did is I let my guard down by failing to close my practice, keeping my doors open, and I was in a state of being that was not right to treat a patient at that time being, being asleep. As a licensed professional, I should have known better instead of trying to act as if I could treat you. No doctor should treat a patient if they're not healthy enough, um, in the right state of mind, to render a treatment. I did not do that. I went forward and rendered a treatment, and in the process of doing so, I caused this harm to a patient through my negligence, through my sloppiness. And it resulted in an episode which can fall under that guise of sexual misconduct because I exposed this patient's genitals in the process of doing treatment. It looks bad. The patient did come back for another treatment five days later and we discussed this and I explained to her and I apologized and she told me you were not yourself. <laughs> That's because I hate to say it but it, facts are facts. I was asleep and I was not fully awake. In fact, I tried to treat her within the first minute of being asleep, and that's my big mistake right there. Looking back in retro, instead of trying to meet all my patients all the time, that's the type of chiropractor I've always been, I should have had a boundary set there, and I would never have been in this mess had I locked my doors. Or had the patient come in, and I just could have said, you know, I'm sorry, I can't treat you right now. Or give me a time, give me, give me some time to wake up. But I jumped on it because I wanted to act as if I had my stuff together, and I did not. 
had my stuff together at that time. I was still discombobulated out of it. And I had paid the price big time. Not just because I lost my license, but because I did harm in the process of treating a patient. I should never have done that. And I'm sorry. Because I was given the responsibility. I'm supposed to be on top of the game. I'm supposed to know what to do and have my office set right when people come in. And I failed to do that. Uh, one of the things that you have uh, submitted was a letter from uh, your psychologist, Laird Bridgman, uh, dated uh, March 20th, 2015. That's marked in the packet as uh, BCE, page 60. Um, and uh, I believe you've seen uh, Dr. Bridgman for uh, uh, 29 psychotherapy sessions, is that correct? It would be about 31 right now, yes. And the first session was on November 6, 2009, correct? Yes. And at that time, uh, were criminal charges pending against you for the incident with... I think there were, yes. And uh, your course of conduct with Dr. Bridgman, it, 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 at least the beginning of it, it predates the, the board's accusation against you, correct? My course of conduct? Oh, I'm saying your course of treatment with Dr. Bridgman. You started treating with Dr. Bridgman before you received the accusation from the board for your revocation, correct? Well, I started treating with Dr. Bridgman because um, in between that time of the incident in January, uh, July of 2007, there was a lot of legal action that was pending and taking place. And there was other life events going on too with family members. So um, I, the board action, um, I don't recall if there was a phone call or a letter submitted when the first action was taken. Now, Dr. Bridgman's uh, treatment, you started treating with him when you still denied any sexual misconduct towards patient, uh, right? I'm sorry, say the question again. Well, I'll, I'll clarify. Maybe you didn't understand what I meant by this. So today, here, here today, you're, you're admitting to at least a limited form of sexual misconduct towards patient. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, when you started treatment with Dr. Bridgman, you, you didn't admit that you had engaged in any sexual misconduct towards patient, right? You, were, you started well, treating, you, you well, started treating with this him. Counselor, and, what, what would make you say something like that? Um, that I didn't admit to the incident that occurred that led me to being depressed? What would make you ask a question like that? Well, okay, well I think my question is, maybe isn't clear. So at the hearing in November 2011, at that hearing before the administrative law judge, you denied engaging in any sexual misconduct towards patient, correct? In the way that I, I, in the way that you're, I, I've never denied exposing the patient's breasts in treatment. There's a certain element of intention as to want to massage, treat, rub for sexual pleasure. That was never a part of that. So when you see those denials, it's based on that understanding. And I know the law is like really clever and wanting to go, you know, you did this and this is, this is um, why you did it. But I need to make sure that we're clear here. I did expose her body part unintentionally. And there was no treatment rendered towards wanting to grope this woman, massage this woman. Um, Fond of her breasts. 
I thought I was doing a treatment under this groggy state of being asleep. But those questions were never asked. They're just asked very, like you're asking me right now, to get it on record as if you admitted this, you admitted that. Well, this is my chance to let everyone know exactly what my understanding is. So when I saw Dr. Bridgman, it was for a variety of different things. Yeah, I, I realized I had made a mistake. I was going through some trouble with my practice. I actually had a, a DUI in, um, in October of 2009. A lot of things were just not going right. So I'm depressed. Did, did you ever seek treatment from Dr. Bridgman for sexual misconduct to no. figure that out? No, I didn't because I don't have a sexual problem. But I do understand boundaries and I do understand that we need to be real careful in what we do even if you're making a mistake and accident. But that is crystal clear correct. I never sought a doctor for any misconduct, sexual mistreatment. The judge tried to opine that why are you seeing the doctor? What is Mr. Glover seeing the doctor for? It's not because I have a sexual problem. No, I'm crystal clear on that. God is my witness. And I want you to know, board, that there's no sexual intent, no perversion here. So I hope that have, helps. Have you ever had a psychological assessment regarding that incident where a psychologist or psychiatrist evaluated you as to how that incident occurred? Well, I did explain to Dr. Bridgman what was going on, and I have never had the need, or nor has it ever been um, suggested. No, I have not. Uh, earlier you were talking a little bit about um, how you would run your practice differently going forward. Um, how can you assure the board that uh, you won't engage in uh, similar misconduct uh, in the future? Well, that's, that's real easy. Um, first of all, board, um, as I mentioned, um, that was just really stupid of me and my mistake for treating, seeing a patient with no secretary, no CA in the office. Um, I owe a responsibility to my practice, to my other patients, because we know we live in a very legalistic society. But even higher than that, I'm clear you do not treat patients like that. That is not a problem. I'm not seeing patients. I've seen tons of people over the years. That's not even an issue of wanting to get sexual gratification of any sort. I'm not wired that way. I am not wired like that and have never been. And I'm crystal clear. I hate that stuff. I, I hate some of the things that go on out there in this world. We all have friends that have been molested, mistreated. Doctors, police, professionals, I'm not on that side, no. To safeguard my practice, I'm going to make sure what I really need to do when I came out the gate, ready to help heal the world, remove substitutions, being a chiropractor. I wish I would have actually partnered with someone and, or been in a group practice. It's been a little challenging being a solo chiro chiropractor. But nonetheless, even if I were to resume that, I see I need to make sure I have staff with me at all times for accountability, for safety. There's no issue, um, counselor, board, there's no issue with me mishandling a patient again or wanting to do something intentionally. And I know you don't know that, and you're doing your job. I, I hope I'm able to convey something here that you don't have to worry about that because that's not an issue here, board. But I do see going forward that I need to make sure I have staff with me on staff. I kept my office open. Open rooms, open door. That's my policy. But even still, I need to make sure that I am don't cross any boundaries, even, not even give patient hugs or kisses. I'm not there to be their friend. I'm not there for them to like me. I'm there to treat what we have discovered in terms of their diagnosis and their treatment plan. And I have a much better understanding of that, of those ethics, those boundaries. Okay. And we go on to the next question. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Thank you. All right, questions from the board. I have no further questions. You answered my question around your plan for partnership with other chiropractors. Thank you. 
I have no questions. Have you, I have one question. Uh, my name is Dr. Corey Lippman. Um, have you been adjusting anybody? <clears throat> have you been adjusting people the past couple years? No, doctor. Um, I, I, I do take care of my wife back here. Um, when she has problems, I, I do, uh, you know, body care on her, soft tissue care, but I have not been practicing chiropractic because I'm not licensed to do so. I have another question. I got a couple. I'm, I'm John Rosa. Um, total restitution that's owed is $10,900. You pay eight hundred and ninety-five dollars. Well, to date, it's um, fifteen hundred and fifty dollars, I believe. Um, at the day of that letter, it was it was eight ninety-five, but today okay. it's um, at fifteen fifty. Can you explain to me why you didn't see the value of setting up some kind of payment plan on a regular basis? Well, I actually do have a payment plan. Um, it's been challenging since I'm um, having to close my practice and all the costs I absorbed um, in the process, the loss of income, um, also um, just uh, some retraining involved, but I do have a plan. I've been paying um, the best I can over the years. Um, there's been some time I have not been employed, um, so it's been challenging to make ends meet, but I've been constantly, consistently paying towards what I owe, and I do plan on paying what I owe um, until it's paid off. And if I have to dip into other resources to pay it off, I had written the letter. I was hoping the board would actually reduce my recovery costs. Well, that was my next question. Why do you feel like it should be, like, it looks like it's cut in half? Do you understand that these costs are cured by investigation processes and so on and so on? Yes, sir. I, I do. And I, I do realize that. Um, I was um, in the process of trying to get a better grasp on all this. Um, I was advised that you might be able to, I might be able to negotiate to reduce some of the costs. So whatever you feel is reasonable, um, I am even more willing to speed up those costs as much as possible. I'm just, first things first, I'm trying to just do the best I can with juggling and everything. It hasn't been easy. Um, Economy's been kind of rough. We all know the cost of California. I mean, you, you're citizens, so you know what's going on. But um, yeah, we practice here. Yes, sir. Um, do you have some kind of a sleep pathology? Uh, no, not in general. Um, no, um, no, I don't. So then, for you to be awakened and then totally be out of, discombobulated. Not know what's going on. That doesn't seem normal to me. I understand. I understand. Um, I'm a I'm a grateful survivor of uh, you know TBI. Um, you know, I, ten years ago I actually incurred a subarachnoid hemorrhage when I crashed on my bike. I had plates in my face. When I was a kid, I was ran over. Well, and is, um, is this a reoccurring issue then? It's not a reoccurring issue. But I realized because at the end of the week, I was really just fatigued, tired. There were some other events going on in my life, and I just... Were you under the influence? Under the influence of what? Alcohol. No, sir. I heard you, at least I thought I heard you say that, basically, that if you had had a staff there, this wouldn't have happened. So your staff is going to keep you out of trouble? No, I mentioned having a staff there. Yeah, I've been practicing 30 years without a staff. Right. There's many of us that do. Okay. And so? I think that would actually add a little extra edge of protection. Keep, keep in mind, when the, the patient did not have an appointment. Now, there was another lady who showed up who did have an appointment. Um, it's still my responsibility to make sure that I'm in the best state of mind to treat my patient and to not make those type of mistakes or errors in treatment. So I mentioned having a staff there because it's just, that's what insurance companies recommend. It's wise. But you are so right there, Dr. Rosa. No, it's, it's not going to keep me from 
it's my responsibility, and I am responsible. I made the mistake. But I want you to know that's part of my plan because I'm the one in the hot seat here. Okay, let me, let me ask you this. So the patient lies down on the table. You take off her bra and open her shirt up, and you don't even know you're doing it? I, when, I, when I lay the patient on her back over here, she's laying on her back. I had reached over, grabbing my infratronic device over here, and did this number right here, pulled her shirt up. I didn't remove her bra, like, let me take your bra off, um, let me unbutton your bra. I pulled the shirt up and didn't realize, in the process of sitting back, I had pulled her shirt up and her breast got exposed. Excuse me, wasn't it said that he took her bra off? Yes, yes, and that the, the movement was from the breast down to above right. the waist and then back A couple three of times. times, right? Three times. Yes. The movement was this movement across her chest, the upper pectoralis muscles, and I did stretch her body, and that's when I realized I had exposed her breasts. How did her bra get off then? It got pulled up. It got pulled, it, the bra never, the, the, the bra's attached and it got pulled up? It got pulled up, that's, it got pulled up, it was written that it was taken off, it got pulled up. But it was never taken off, it was pulled up and her breasts were exposed in the process. It wasn't like I said, let me take your bra off or let me undo your bra. I pulled it up in the process of lifting her shirt, in the process of sitting back. I did it so fast and so quickly, I was not even aware. But that, that's, that's, part of that was addressed in the, in the criminal court, but there was never any mention did I actually take her bra off, like here, let me unbutton your bra. So I just want to make sure I understand. So by doing it, you hooked your fingers underneath the underwires of her bra and pulled it all up and you didn't know you were doing it. I actually pulled her shirt from down below to put the diaphragm, the infratronic, on her thymus and pulled up and caught part of the bra in the process as I was sitting back. I was actually very forceful and aggressive in that treatment, sloppy. That's all the questions I have. A quick, quick follow-up, uh, Dr. Mueller. Um, if I understood correctly, you said that you kissed or perhaps saw many patients uh, on the cheek. Can you tell, is that one more patient, five more patients, six more pair, more than 10, less than 10, more than 20? How many more patients? Um, I don't have the exact number there, doctor, and I'm, I'm just talking about, but I, I couldn't even tell you, doctor. It's just <laughs> like shaking someone's hand, give them a hug on the way out, a uh, kiss on the forehead. Um, you know, it's not a common practice. Did anyone ever, out of those patients, whatever many, did anyone ever said, you know, please don't do it or stop doing it? Did they ever approach you privately or publicly and tell you, you know, not to do it again? <clears throat> no, sir. Yeah, that's it. No further. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dekar. Yes. Um, well, the, the public concern seemed to be well addressed initially with a lot of contrition, but the limited admission as to what occurred during that incident um, with patients seems to be at odds with uh, the findings of the ALJ from uh, the hearing. Those findings were adopted by the board, so uh, it, the, the concern would be that um, if the conduct that was found to have occurred has not been admitted, it's difficult to, um, uh, to be convinced that it will not uh, reoccur. Um, and uh, also, um, I think there's a concern here that we have uh, treatment for depression um, and, and uh, alcoholism, um, but without an admission of any sort of intentional sexual act, that's never been addressed. Uh, so I think there is a remaining public concern if we have a finding on record of sexual misconduct, but we have no treatment for uh, that sort of behavior 
and no psychological testing or other report uh, to indicate uh, the likelihood of recurrence or why it occurred in the first place and that things have been done to address it. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a record here um, uh, to satisfy public safety concerns given what was found as a result of the November 2011 hearing. Um, so uh, it would be helpful if uh, uh, the hearing were, uh, if the petition were denied, if there were any further reapplication to have, if it would be great evidence to have some sort of psychological assessment uh, with testing. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think public concern remains. Dr. Glover, final remarks. Well, once again, um, board, um, um, I'm sorry that I had to appear before you regarding this incident. Um, if getting my license restored requires getting an evaluation, I'm open to that. Um, as I mentioned, the mistake I made was a mistake, unintentional. I understand the state's uh, position on protecting the, the safety of the public. I already expressed that I'm, I'm a part of that public. I don't think you have anything to worry about in terms of me making that mistake again because that's not going to happen. That's not an issue. I have a plan of action to, uh, of accountability, of, of safety. Um, I have taken massive action to um, address my alcoholism, um, to uh, make sure that when I practice that I'm around other practitioners. It's, it's not an issue of wanting to at all expose a patient and make them vulnerable. That's, that has never been a problem. I'm at your mercy board and um, I'm willing to do whatever it needs to be done to get my license back, um, pay my recovery costs. My wife has been a great support here. In fact, she actually has um, mentioned she would love to be a part of the practice. She's helped me out in many events. She knows who I am. As I said, I'm sorry to actually brush shame and disrespect our profession because of this incident that I caused. I know it doesn't look right. My issue with alcoholism has been resolved, um, even with dealing with this depression. I've gotten much better in terms of being healthier. And that has never really been an issue with my ability to practice chiropractic. The two are separate. Thank you for your time, board, and I Hope you grant me my license back. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the hearing in this matter. The record is closed. The matter is submitted. Cross record. So we are going to have to proceed into closed session for a brief, um, I'd say maybe 15 minutes um, to deliberate. So I'm going to ask everybody to leave the room, please. Okay, we're back on the record, um, out of closed session, deliberating the petitions. It's 3.03, and we're going to begin with uh, item number 13, update on pending regulations. Marcus. Marcus. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to provide you guys a quick update regarding our pending regulations. Um, 
there's been no movement on groups B or C of the regulations. However, um, our number one, our application for licensure package is currently with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Specifically, it's in the budget office. Um, remember, we noticed that at the beginning of the year, so we're coming down to crunch time on that package, um, just to, so you guys are aware of that. Um, and then the second package that we're working on that you voted on in in March or in May is the CPEI package. Um, there are some current changes recently to the process regarding regulations and submission to DCA in, in their review. So um, that package is actually back with us at the board. Um, I'm making a couple of changes before we submit it to DCA. And just so you guys are aware as far as process, the new process will consist of us submitting the package to DCA and they're gonna do a lot of their um, the review up front now. So they will have and do a thorough review and then we'll, before we notice it. So they will do maybe a, a one month or two month review and then we'll notice it and resume the normal process after that. So just so you guys know, it might take a little bit longer for our regulation packages before they're noticed. May I? Yes. Okay. I was just going to ask, um, where are you submitting it within DCA? Is it there? So we submitted to LedgeReg, um, okay. and then they make copies, and, all, and concurrently they submit it to, to Legal for Review, so they go to Spencer. Submitted to LedgeReg, and then to Spencer? Yes. And then as far as process, once they complete their reviews, they go to the director for it goes to budgets and then the director for signature. Okay. Um, no. I, did you any that's it. This, okay, so that's all for red. Um, if, you, if you guys have any other questions, I'm, I'll be glad to answer it, but that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you, Marcus. And then legislative update, do you want to do that as well? Or, um, there's the, um, yeah. We, item 14? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, do you want to do that or do you want to? Yeah, I can do it. Um, so as, as the board is aware, um, Julie provided information earlier regarding our legislative, you know, um, the 10 bills that we reviewed this year. Um, most of the bills are dead. The bills that I wanted to provide you guys an update on um, are in the memo. So AB 2744, which was the referral bill or quote unquote the Groupon bill, um, that bill was actually, it was signed. And then also SB 1348, which was titled Licensure Application and Military Experience, um, that bill was also signed by the governor. Um, and then um, finally, the bill that is most of most interest to the board is AB 2182, which was the Molin bill that we discussed at the last meeting regarding school athletics and neurocognitive testing. That bill was unfortunately vetoed by the governor, um, and his reason for vetoing the bill were fiscal concerns, um, expenditures outside of the normal budget process was his main concern. There's no money for it. It's not that there's no money. There's just According to the governor, they believe that there's a specific time to introduce anything that's budget related, and this bill would have required expenditures outside of that process. Okay. Thank you. So we need to go back to strategic plan here. So we're going to uh, now take on the strategic plan that we. Did you, I'm sorry, but I'm doing a but did you want to do the. Um, Next year's calendar first, yeah, or we get that done with the three days for each one. It doesn't matter. I just asked. Yeah, we sure. Do it. Go to. I didn't know what your game plan is. He just realized that he missed. To get it. through. Okay. Okay. So we're looking at. Um, we're looking at. Uh, Starts with January. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we do quarterly, we, we have to have a meeting in January. Um, and then um, there's, um, if we do quarterly, May, July, and October, but we don't necessarily have to have it in any of those other months. So, so if, you know, May doesn't work for most people, we could go to April or June or something, but um, this is just a guideline. And, um, and there is a um, 2017 calendar on the flip side of that, if anybody wants to refer to that and just see. Um, uh, 
the um, any holidays are already marked off. So, so January, and then I have so January. Yeah, January, I would I, my only availability is at the end of the month, the last week. So, do you want to do the twenty fourth? Do a Tuesday or well, Thursday? That's good because there are other options that are um, that are actually more convenient. I think there's um, there's the Department of Consumer Affairs headquarters, which is closer to the airport, and um, it's a little more convenient than holding it at the Capitol. There's also um, Sierra Health. Can you say that? Again? Sierra Health. Um, Sierra Health. Um, so they um, it's a nonprofit organization. They have a beautiful facility um, on the river and they offer it to healthcare related um, entities, uh, regulatory entities or whatever. Um, they they offer their facility for free and uh, very nice state of the art. They even provide you with food. <laughs> so, uh, so we could, I mean we would have to check on availability for the day we want but uh, that's an option and then um, most likely we could always get um, a room at DCA. They have a number of conference rooms. Frank and I go for the 26. 26. I prefer the capital, but I'll do whatever you guys. Uh, okay, I, I have one. Um, I'm going to, um, I can do the 12th or the 19th. Um, I can't do the 26th. I'm going to be gone that week. So, But I don't necessarily have to. No, you, you do. So, so I, I, <laughs> I can call. I cannot do the 26th. The 19th that week, it's uh, inauguration week in D.C., so I'm on uh, order that whole week. So let's say the 12th. The 12th, like, we can squeeze that. That's, uh, I mean, are we going to have, is there going to be much work done between now and then? That's my only concern. No. Well, we, well the only we, thing, we, we could, have to have a meeting sense. that wants to elect officers. To elect officers. So it could be that that's a teleconference. Let's do a teleconference. And yeah, then and then move it to have the meeting in February. Let's do a teleconference. We've done that before. Yeah. So we can do a teleconference on the 12th. Yeah, that sounds actually good. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, if that works, because that, that'll be really, that'll be very short. Okay. So, um, can we also tentatively uh, agree on a time? Is 10 o'clock uh, a good time for everybody? I don't know. That's what we've been doing in the past. I mean, what do we anticipate? A half an hour meeting? Just for a half an hour max. Because it'll, 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 it'll just be one item, it'll just be an election time. of officers. Because our act okay. requires us to do that in January. No, 10 is fine. Is fine. Is fine. I'm, I'm good either way. Okay, so the 12th? Then what about what February? Time? What time do we decide? Would you say what time on the 12th? Whatever you people prefer. 10. Ten. Just say 10. 10. February so, 10. I'm fine for 10. No, January 12th. January 12th. January 12th. January 12th. Oh, at 10. 10. And that's for the election of officers. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then in February. February then would be the full board meeting. Um, what about the 16th? That's a Thursday. That works for me. Can we alternate between some Tuesdays and Thursdays? Okay. Tuesday would be Valentine's Day and wonderful. Right. Right. Okay. You people okay. might have a problem with that. We could have a we could have a heart themed board meeting. <laughs> No, February 16th. Let's say the 16th. 16th. Some of us have a lot. <laughs> and then go February into April, 16th. July, October. So 16th is still in Sacramento, though, right? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, just want to make sure. Okay. Then let's look at April or May. We might want to move move towards May June since we're having the meeting yeah. in the middle of February. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm booked the last week in April, so May would be better for me. So is May a week? Doing but I, I don't know how long we want to wait if there's depending upon pieces of legislation. Well, I'll hope we do the first week in May. May. So I would say no later than the first week in May. May second, maybe. Yeah. What about so, May second, April twenty fifth, or May second? April 25th would not work for me. Okay. That no, week, um, that so let's say May 2nd. May 2nd, we can make it work. 
Okay. Now that's Southern California. Do we want to identify? That's Southern Cal. Yeah. LA. LA. I'm so I'm going to work. So May second. Oh. Yeah. Let's say May second in LA. Um, LA. Okay. Give me one moment here. Um, Corey's struggling over here. Give him. Corey, what do you need? Can I just make a suggestion? Because traditionally, the last couple of years we've done spring meeting at a, at one of the chiropractic colleges. Are we going to continue that? And if so, are we going to continue alternating between the campuses? And if that's Let's the case, then we need to take that into consideration. Yeah. Let's yes. Do this oh, on that is yes. No. Let's do it at LAX. Yeah, I mean, for a number of reasons, um, LAX is more convenient for, for everybody. everybody. We're always yeah, rushing. So, um, we can go back to the schools after. For Burbank? Next yeah, Burbank time. is, um, Burbank works too. LAX, I vote for LAX. Julie and Dion can fight that <laughs> 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 Yeah, but all of these guys would rather fly into Burbank than. Wait one really? second here. I'm, a, uh, I'm neutral. LAX is so much easier to fly. I'm Carolina. Yeah, LAX is much easier for flights. Still drive down LAX. More places. flights available. Well, there's too. more flights available, yeah. Yeah. They have, I mean, they every, have every carrier flies in. Yeah, but there's like, they're likely going to be delayed out of LAX. Yeah, but Sergio likes to fly in at midnight. Oh, you don't like to fly in the morning of. I'm not so high brow as well. <laughs> I'm low brow in the valley. All right, well, good. <laughs> so, um, give me a second here. So I, think I, second. I don't know if I could do the second. Huh? You can't. I can do the second. You cannot. You the fourth? No, that Sir, week I cannot do that week. Oh, the week of what? Then the ninth the or the eleventh? Not the eleventh. The week of what? Of May. Yes, of May. Can't Corey can't do the eleventh. The ninth of May. Okay. Can we change it to the ninth. Yes, yeah, still no, LAX. Have, uh, I'll buy you lunch, Julie. Uh, you can stay at my house. Girl, I don't know if I'm gonna be. So. Oh, I'm just claiming <laughs> that. Just by the way. <laughs> I just want to bump it to the 16th, so you guys. No. I'm just concerned, you guys, about pieces of legislation that I think it, you're looking at too late. What about the last? Well, we could do like we've done this year and if something comes do up, a teleconference meeting if we have to vote on legislation. Uh, for sure. So, I mean, that's just throwing out options. Do so you guys want to do the 16th or the 18th right. then if we reserve that option? But then you're looking at, you know, the rest of the calendar, too. Heather, Heather can't do the 18th. Of May, um, she could do the 18th in Sacramento only. Um, but who? The 18th of what? Of May. Um, yeah, um, Heather won't be available. So nine works for me. Either nine or the 16th. You know, you know one nine doesn't work for Heather. How about flipping? Where we, if we're doing the teleconference there, can we do the first meeting in Southern California? In January or so, or then yeah, we don't have to. Um, we're not um, held so, to any. So, so we're not. So we could do in February in. Ooh. Yeah, we could do February in LA. If that everybody's okay with that, okay with that. And then do what May in Sacramento? Um, yeah. yeah, do okay. May in Sacramento. That works. Are we is that what we? Okay, sorry, May 9th We're looking. No, that doesn't work. So February sixteenth in LA. So February sixteenth now it's in LA. May sixteenth. Is that what you're talking about? No, February sixteenth. No, 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 right. right. The May date. If we, if we did if we did the eighteenth um, in Sacramento, Heather could attend. But if it's not in Sacramento, she has a conflict. Well, let's do the sixteenth then. Sixteenth. I prefer the sixteenth, eighteenth. I cannot. Yeah, let's do the sixteenth in Sacramento. Sixteenth in Sacramento. Sacramento. Okay. In Sacramento. Yeah, sixteenth in Sacramento. So that we get to come down to Southern California instead <coughs> of Sacramento. All right. So let me change this. Yeah, we could do July or August of, <coughs> if we want to keep them spaced a little. Yeah, I, I'm just spacing. Then I would say late July, early August. The first week of August is out for me. Okay, late July. Look at how it's 27th. <coughs> Heather, oh, yeah, she doesn't have any yet now. Black out dates. July twenty seventh. Anyone? June, July. Where Go. is it going? Going. San Diego or L A. One or the other. <coughs> or Bakersfield or Orange County. Or Visalia. Yeah. <laughs> what? 
Well, if we're going to do a school. It's going to have to right be here. It would have to be way here. Way to go, right here on July. Is it an inspection? We need to find out. Yeah. So, what are we is, um, They're year round. They, they, are there students in July? Um, we can still have some guys here. July 27th. Unless you guys want to do January down there. No. It's a teleconference. No. January is a teleconference. It would have to be February. No, the February meeting. <coughs> is one better for you guys? Session either way. July. Let's do July at the school. So we can treat it Sacramento for Whitty. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I mean, why don't we like July, like do San, San Diego or LA somewhere a little nicer? Or San Francisco, and then we can do. Um, San Francisco is so considered southern. Then I mean, northern. It doesn't matter because then we could do um, southern in October and November. So they don't have to be necessarily. Wait, wait, wait. All What's our main so, San Francisco in July. Yes. Is that what I hear? What what date is that? Seven, twenty-seven. Twenty-seven? Uh-huh. It's July twenty-seventh? Yes. Always, okay. It's always cold. We're doing it in the winter. Yeah, no, exactly. The summer winter. It's October to San Francisco. I know, that's what I was saying. It's but if you're coming from July. Sacramento, that cold is nice. <laughs> July. Or LA. Yeah. All right, so we're going LA. Alright, so then October. Sometimes the armpits but then they are. So do we kept do we kept the uh, sorry do we change to the school the February or not we kept it in um, LA well I yeah think LA February is LA um, May is Sacramento, Sacramento. Um, July July is San Francisco and October we October November will be um, in Whittier okay so what dates in October um, let me see what the nineteenth. I still suggest uh, San Francisco. Yes. Twenty in October. So I'm with we'll Sergio. Switch, uh, we can switch October in San Francisco in July. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm with Sergio on that one. That's good. That, that works. You guys want to do that? So are are we looking at still the Tuesday? If we're flopping Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, we only have one Tuesday right now, so that would be the twenty fourth. Uh, October. October. October twenty. So October 24th in San Francisco, is that what I hear? Well, he's saying that in, instead of going to uh, Whittier, instead of going to San Francisco in July, go to Whittier in July and go to San Francisco in October. Just because it's cold in San Francisco in July. There's a song about it. We were there this year. Yeah, is that what is it? What is everybody saying? October 24th. October 24th. Does that date work? Let's let's get the date. Let me look at Heather's just a second. Okay, I'm going to come back at the different. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. October 24th? I don't know where I am. October 24th. Okay, so. I'm going to San Francisco on a Thursday. October 24th. Well, I'm um, Dion, Dion's saying something, I think. She's saying she's I would rather be on a Thursday, Sergio. So, speak up. Uh, so, the 26th? 24th. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 October 26th in San Francisco. It shouldn't be an issue for you, right? No, no, that's not an issue for me, but what are we doing? Are we doing, are we going to do Whittier in July? Yes, and then in October. She's um, saying that so we're not going to be flipping Tuesdays and Thursdays then. So no, there would be one Tuesday. All right, so let's go back to doing uh, uh, July. Why don't we do Tuesday in uh, Whittier? July twenty fifth. Let's see here. Where are we at? Yeah. Uh, we had July twenty seventh. Yeah. Right, but we were trying to do Tuesday Thursday flipping. Yeah. So he's saying, is there availability instead on July twenty fifth? Yes. Let me check. That's fine with me. Wait. 26. Well, let's, do, let's do July 1st. Why don't we do, if, if you want to Wait. do hmm? a Thursday in San Francisco in October, then it let's would be the do, 26th. Let's do Tuesday in Whittier. Right. Okay, right. so Tuesday the 25th of July in Whittier. I need a highlighter. Of course I did. Okay. And then the 26th, we're we doing San Francisco. 26. The Giants better be playing. The wait the 
26th of October. Yeah. 26th of October. Oh. Um, SF. All right. Okay. We're done. And then we had a May 16th in Sacramento, correct? Mm -hmm. So July. May 16th now is July 20th. 20th. Yeah. Why and don't you February 16th in LA. In LACC. In Whittier. Okay. And Val's going to send us a memo on all this. Sacramento, Whittier, and we have a conference called Wind. All right, can we move on? We can move on. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to the strategic plan. Twenty seventeen through twenty nine twenty twenty strategic plan. Has everybody had a chance to review it? Yes. Uh, can I just make a couple comments? Not long. I just want to offer that at our strategic planning. I mean, yes, at our government affairs and strategic planning meeting last month, we reviewed this in depth and. Um, discuss several changes that were incorporated. Um, I have a couple of things that I just want to make some suggestions on. Um, I think it's, and I mentioned this in our planning meeting, I think it's great that there's this letter um, from Sergio that just achieves it, I, or that introduces it. I have a couple of um, suggestions to the wording. So in the third paragraph, we're proud to have accomplished most of the goals from 2014 to 17. I would just say offer like either overwhelming majority or 90% or whatever the percentages it are. Um, most to me, I think there's just an opportunity to strengthen that. I so like overwhelming majority. I said overwhelming majority. That'll work. Okay. Are there many that we haven't accomplished? No. So why don't we just say all? Well, because I think we determined that some didn't apply. That's why I suggested okay. like 90% or whatever the, the percentage actually was. We still have some where the completion date wasn't until 2017. So we, we haven't. Right. Right. So that's why I said overwhelming majority. Um, Got that right, Marcus? So. Marcus's letter. The other suggestion that I have is on page Wait, seven. Um, 2.2 and 2.3, they both are collaborate, and under 2.2, it's italicized collaborate. So I'm not sure if that was. What page? What page? On page seven, under enforcement, 2.2 and 2.3, they both say collaborate, and 2.2 is italicized for collaborate. So. I don't know if that meant because they were trying to come up with a better word. Dr. Or... Elginer, um, at the committee meeting, we discussed it, but we didn't come up with a word until we wanted to open up for discussion at the okay. board meeting. So let's have a discussion. Hmm? Is Why there... are we using gauge? Yeah, I like for two point two. I think engage. Engage is a very good one. I agree. That's why he's chair. I know. No. Engage no. with professional associations. Yes. I think that's great. <laughs> um, Marcus, this, um, you know how I feel about this format. Uh, the sh there is no chevron for number five under page ten. So this, this format has such that, and same thing on page five, that it's a, a series of chevrons to get down there. Was there supposed to be a chevron? Or chevron. Okay. Oh, that's what that's called. That thing is called a chevron. I'm just saying there is none. I don't know if there's supposed to be. I expressed to Marcus that I don't care for this this template that and that solid used. I don't think it's as easy to read as Dr. the Elgin. last one. And also, um, so I connected with solid, and as far as the format, um, this is what they provide us. And then so after we finalize this, we will then um, move it over to publications and see if that's how we actually got the previous format. Okay. So this is not the final look, 
and before we approve it, we will provide you guys with an opportunity just to look at it and see if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing that I have is that um, I think it should be added to page 12 that at the strategic, strategic planning discussion, so we have in here, you know, the number of surveys and everything else, which I think is great. I, I would also suggest that we um, mention the member, the, the number of professional participants and members of the public that participated in our strategic planning discussion as well. Those are the only changes I have. So, can I make, I'd like to make a motion to approve the 2017-2020 strategic plan uh, with the identified amendments. I'll second it. And before we go any further, no. Oh, it should be 20. Thank you, Val. Good job, Val. Wait, just, just to be clear. I think we discussed at the strategic planning session that we wanted three years, a three-year plan, so that members would be able to, so, so do we want to make that 20, or are we not, how are we counting it? Like 2017, oh, yeah. 20, oh. 18, 2019. Yeah. But, yes. it, but we have to have it start in 17. 17. So it starts in, it's 17, 18, 19. So it's 17 and 19. Let's all count our fingers for the camera. Right. So it be the beginning, but it'll end at 20. All right. So, so then withdraw 19. your motion? Huh? No. No. You can amend it. She, didn't no, she, she doesn't have the power. She was just identifying. It. So I've already made the motion and you seconded it. So. All right. Any discussion? Public comment? Call for the vote, please. Polino? Yes. Elginer? Yes. Uh, Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Rosa? Yes. And Mafino? Yes. Right. Okay, so moving on, so we have public comment not on the agenda. Public comment not on the agenda. <laughs> I'll make something up. <laughs> Nothing? Future agenda items. I would have liked to see discussion around um, possibly changing the way that we do our meetings as far as time and with the petitioners, particularly in cases where we have important things like the EO um, evaluation and that sort of thing. We tend to rush through. At the end of the day, it's always we're always rushing with all because of those petitioner hearings. So. Um, if I can suggest, um, we um, that would probably be an appropriate discussion for government affairs, um, and then if we have a governor's a government affairs meeting between now and the February meeting, and then um, they can make a recommendation. Can you handle that, Julie? I can. I can absolutely handle that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Any other future items? Good future agenda items. You guys going to get marked as absent? Get what? Get marked as absent. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, I think um, we are yeah. going to then move uh, into closed session. There yeah. is nothing left on the agenda. Therefore, you can stay around if you like for the brief opening. And closing back we'll just again. come back into open session to end the meeting. So.